So following the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Chancellor Scholz announced this in a solemn speech to the German parliament, a so-called Zeitenwender, a turning point, whose main goal is to adapt the German foreign and security policy to the new geostrategic context. The goal of this speech was twofold. First, giving a political signal to the public opinion and to the international partner partners of Germany by signaling that the German government had gotten the measure of the situation created by this war and would thus be more proactive in the course of the conflict alongside Ukraine and its allies and partners. The second goal was to identify new priorities for the federal government as regards energy security and defense in order to overcome shortcomings, not to say vulnerabilities identified in both fields. As regards defense, the declared objective is to make the Bundeswehr, the German army, I, I quote, the most effective army in Europe. To this end, Chancellor Scholz announced the creation of a one-time special fund of 100 billion euros for defense procurement, as well as an increase in the defense budget to 2% uh, of the GDP. The purpose of our debate today is to discuss the way the German government is implementing the Chancellor's pledge in the field of defense and try to assess the main achievements as well as the obstacles which could be met in this endeavor. The main underlying question is the following. Is this concept of Zeitenwende the beginning of an ambitious project which would lead to a repositioning of the German defense policy at national level, at European level, and also at a more global level, and especially within the Alliance? Or is it a necessary but limited reaction to the war in Ukraine, essentially a matter of reassurance towards the allies and partners based on the catch-up effect as regards defense spending in Germany? We will try to answer two main questions to this end. First, how to assess the impact of this financial surge for the German forces in the light of the political discussion in the German parliament? And second, beyond the financial resources, what are the most critical issues to be tackled in order to secure a stable and efficient modernization process? And for this discussion, I have the pleasure to have, to have with me today two researchers with, with, with two different perspectives. First, uh, Torben Schutz, Associate Fellow at the German Council on Foreign Relations, the DGAP, and he's in, uh, in also part of, this, of the DGAP's Security and Defense Program. And Paul Morris, Research Fellow at the Study Committee on Franco-German Relations, the CERFA at IFRI. So I will start with Paul, uh, this discussion uh, regarding the, the first element, which is, uh, I would say, the, the, the current situation. Where do we stand? Because three months after this landmark speech, a lot have been, has been said, but uh, the question is uh, whether uh, the deeds have followed uh, the world. And uh, what has been implemented uh, in, the in, the, in the course of these three months, especially a few days after, uh, we are a few days after the debate and the, the vote in the German parliament, um, what remains to be done and what is uh, the, uh, in the first place the result of this vote by the Bundestag for this uh, special purpose fund of 1 billion euros. Paul, what, we, what could you say uh, today about this situation? Thank you, Eric. Thank you for um, the invitation and the organization of uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, as you say, um, Olaf Scholz's speeches uh, announced three days uh, after the beginning of the, of the war. Um, uh, this, this 
100 billion euros program for the, the Bundeswehr. And uh, you said that this is uh, this uh, no, often quoted speeches uh, to the Bundestag in the uh, Zeit and then. Um, I will maybe uh, first uh, explain what are we talking about. Uh, we, we spoke about 100 billion euros. We are speaking about site and vendor turning points. What does it mean? Um, you said that three months after the speeches, the Bundestag uh, gave uh, last week the green light to the, the introduction of a, a, spe a special fund to uh, strengthen uh, the, the Bundeswehr. And uh, I quote here the Chancellor um, Olaf Scholz, he said, uh, it is the right answer to the changing times. Why are is this um, uh, special fund the right answer? I have six questions quickly uh, with, uh, to, to, to explain what are we talking about. First, why is a special fund for the Bundeswehr necessary? We, have, we will speak about this maybe later, but we have to, to, to see the, the, the current state of the Bundeswehr. Today, uh, after Russia's attack on the Ukraine, uh, um, in order to be uh, um, to be able to uh, reliably uh, protect freedom and democracy, that's uh, what we we think in Germany, uh, and to uh, to to protect uh, the uh, the international law, the international order, uh, Germany needs an efficient and well equipped federal army. What is uh, now not the case, and. Uh, the, the, the federal army, the Bundeswehr, have to be in order have to, to be able to, to invest quickly. Uh, and the, 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 the federal government had set up a special one time. You say that uh, funds with a total of one hundred billion euros. Uh, second question: What is the purpose of this uh, special fund? Um, the purpose of this uh, special trust fund is to, to maintain to maintain this the existing capa uh, capabilities of the Bundeswehr and to be able to, to make the necessary investments uh, in defense and alliance to uh, capabilities. Uh, it is intended to contribute to the procurement of equipment tailored to the needs of the Bundeswehr more quickly than the usual annual budgetary uh, which, uh, which uh, would allow. Uh, in addition to the defense budgets, it is uh, intended to finance major Bundeswehr projects defined in close consultation with uh, the Bundestag. And the Chancellor Scholz said, I quote, uh, our goal is an efficient and progressive Bundeswehr, a Bundeswehr that can uh, fulfill its main task of defending the country and its alliance, because it is sufficiently equipped. Third question, what will the money spent on? I will just, yeah, I, I will not explain all the details, but just uh, an overview of uh, the, the, the money uh, of, the, of this uh, special fund. Um, a large part of the, of the money will be used for the purchase of a large equipment, as I said. And they are specifically named in the economic plan uh, for this uh, special fund. Uh, I will just give a few numbers here. Uh, 33 uh, per, uh, billion euros uh, for the Air Force, uh, and will be the, the largest uh, single item of uh, expenditure in the next few years. Um, uh, this project includes, uh, as, we, as we know, um, the, the purchase of the F-35 uh, and, and the success of, of, uh, to the Tornado, but also the, the procurement of the Eurofighter, uh, ECR. Uh, second point, uh, it will be the, the army, uh, and the army will receive uh, 16 billion euros, the navy uh, 9, million, uh, 9 billion euros, sorry, and uh, there will be 20 billion euros uh, which, uh, which can be used for the procurement, I quote, in the command and control capability and digitalization complex. Fourth question. How is a special fund financed? It's so maybe uh, uh, the biggest question in Germany. And <coughs> sorry, the, the special fund uh, has, uh, has uh, its uh, own uh, credit uh, authorization of 
100 billion euros and this credit must be repaid by 2031. And we have uh, to, 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 to it's, 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 it's a credit, we, we have to, to, to keep that in mind. Uh, it does not receive any funds from the federal budgets uh, and it's managed separately uh, from it. And the resources of the special funds are available in a multi-year uh, basis and can be used as needed. Um, the, the Defense Minister, uh, Chris, uh, Christine, Lambrecht, uh, Christine Lambrecht, uh, said, with this special fund, we are re-equipping our armed force so that they can fully perform their main task. It's a good question. Defending our country and our allies, but maybe Torbert will uh, explain that later. Uh, we are ensuring that the Bundeswehr is fully operational. We will speak about strategy and money maybe later. Five uh, uh, first points, we, we spoke about this. Uh, what, why do, do, do we need to change the constitution, the basic law in Germany to, to, to have this uh, special funds? Um, also, I, 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 I will not uh, make uh, um, um, all details about the constitution in Germany, but uh, there is an amendment to, to the article uh, 87A of the basic law, it is the article about development and tax of the armed force. You, you, you can find it uh, easily on the Bundestag website. Uh, and this uh, amendment creates uh, the constitutional basis for the creation of this uh, special fund. And uh, the federal government uh, needed uh, for this, uh, for this uh, change of the constitution, uh, the, the voices of, of the opposition, uh, that's uh, the CDU and CSU, uh, the union. And uh, it's, I will speak about the, the, the political uh, consequences of, of this site and vendor later, but uh, we have to, to, to to keep in mind that uh, in Germany, we needed uh, um, a compromises to uh, change this constitution. And um, uh, the, last po uh, the last point uh, is uh, what, what is the impact of the special fund on the NATO's objectives? Uh, you, you say that Eric, uh, Chancellor Scholz said, we will, uh, we will uh, I quote, invest year after year more than 2% of its gross domestic products in our defense, what Germany uh, did, uh, doesn't uh, uh, do now. And um, this, uh, this, the additional investments uh, for, for, from the special fund, um, will not guarantee that the two uh, percent uh, investment for the defense uh, we will not guarantee constitutionally that there will be a, a two percent two percent uh, investment for the defense in the next year uh, there is uh, a lot of political agreeing between uh, uh, social democrats and conservative on this point also uh, with the greens but uh, what uh, is uh, what does it mean, 2%, 2%, 2%, it will, uh, as Eric said, make of the Bundeswehr the, the biggest army in Europe uh, with the investment. It's, uh, that means that about 70 billion euro per year uh, will be spent for the Bundeswehr and the defense in Germany. Uh, today it's around 50 um, uh, billions and uh, in France it's around uh, 50 billions too. That means that Germany will spend more that, than France for this defense without nuclear weapons. And, and the question maybe I will open uh, here, uh, the, 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 the discussion, uh, what for? Uh, what, uh, why are the, we, we no, uh, 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 some answer. I say that for the Air Force, for example, and so on. But what is the purpose of this fund? What is the purpose of this money? Why needs Germany more money? And what will Germany make with this money in the next few years? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. So we've seen that uh, we have come to a first result, which is the approval of this 100 billion special fund. Um, and uh, we see that uh, Germany has uh, 
uh, has not taken a, a formal pledge about this two-person goal, which was, I would here recall it, which was uh, uh, issued uh, through a, a declaration of the uh, of the alliance uh, summit in Newport in Wales in 2014, because members NATO's member states pledged to aim at spending 2% of their respective GDP on defense within a decade. So it's, it's already uh, uh, eight years back. And uh, the, uh, it was not only a debate about the 2% uh, metric, but it was also uh, linked with another uh, pledge, with what, which was to also uh, spend more than 20% of their defense budget on major equipment including relate, uh, research and development. So it is a quantitative, it is not only a, 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 a quantitative issue, it is also a qualitative issue, and we have to see uh, what uh, remains to be done. And it is a, a way to, to make a transition with Tarbon, because uh, we have very much focused on the, on the uh, I would say, the financial part of this, uh, of this discussion. But I think it's time to see how also, uh, the, I would say the, the more qualitative aspects regarding this uh, modernization uh, purpose, because uh, the stated goal of the Chancellor is to make the Bundeswehr the most efficient conventional army in Europe. But the question is, uh, is it just a matter of money? And uh, if I remember uh, uh, Eva Hegel, for example, in her capacity as a uh, uh, ombudsman for the Bundeswehr, she outlined that there are appalling deficiencies in the, in the Bundeswehr as regards equipment and combat readiness, because we see that it is not only a question of, uh, of how many tanks you formally have uh, in line, it is also the, the capacity to, 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 to commit them, to, to, to engage them, and, and here the combat readiness is also an issue. And what are the main, it, it would be my question to, to Tauben, what are the main non-financial hurdles the Bundeswehr has to overcome so that the words, uh, the pledge of the Chancellor, can be followed by deeds? So, Torben, I would be grateful if we could have your views on these different points. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, good morning from, from Berlin, and uh, thanks for the invitation and um, the, the first input. So, let me maybe briefly start by adding one one to two points on, on the financial side of things just to to, to i think clarify the the context um one of the problems so to speak is yes we have the special fund now decided but at least um, at the moment the future projections for the regular defense budgets remain more or less flat at 50 billion euros and you know we all know if you have uh, a nominal flat budget, your real purchasing power is, is decreasing. So that is um, one point where the government will have to, to have some negotiations amongst themselves over, over the next year, basically. Um, but, but still, you know, taking together the regular defense budgets and yearly spending from this special fund, Germany is, is indeed likely to, to become um, the largest conventional defense spender in, in Europe, which, I mean, isn't that new during the Cold War. That was also um, the case for, for quite some time. So it's not, not um, that unsurprising, so to speak, um, also given the, the economic uh, situation of Germany compared to, to our neighbors. Um, I think what has come out of the special fund and the list of projects which are pursued by it and you know written into it is is really underlining what um, Eric just said when it comes to the defense investment share on the regular defense budget, which in Germany for the past decades essentially was under twenty percent and. The main task really of the special fund is to correct this historical investment um, gap that was created over the past decades. And so the projects within the special funds mostly are really modernization projects trying to, you know, 
uh, introduce generational change, for example, in, in, in combat aircraft or in um, armored vehicles. There are some projects written into it which address existing um, capability gaps, like uh, ground-based air defense, especially, you know, for example, in, in, in the short to, to medium range. And some, um, some projects, but, but really very, very few, are kind of addressing um, the growth of certain capabilities beyond current structures in terms of, of size and, and quantity. Um, that's just, just a couple of, um, of, of short points on, on the financial sides. And when it, when it comes to the, the non-financial parts, to, to come back to your question, Eric, I think there are three, three things um, which are important. The first one is um, German government policy towards arms exports, right? So one of, one of the kind of smaller parts of the Zeitenwende was um, that the German government one day before Scholz's speech in the parliament decided to um, deliver weapons to Ukraine. Um, you know, we, we all know how difficult the debate about the delivery of heavy weapons is, even though the government announced the delivery of, of heavy weapons a couple of weeks ago in forms of the um, air defense um, units, you know, Gepard uh, tanks, and uh, of course the uh, Panzerbitzer 2000 um, self-propelled artillery um, together with the Netherlands. But it's, it's still a, an issue of, of much debate in, in Germany and so within the government, but nevertheless, for the second time in, in, I don't know, not even a decade, the German government decided to deliver weapons into an active war zone. The first time was to the Peshmerga in their fight against the Islamic State. And both exceptions are, are really that. Um, huge exceptions to the to the regular German uh, arms export policy. So the question here really is where these or is Ukraine an exception to the normal German uh, arms export pattern? And I mean, I, I don't have to tell a French audience what a headache German export policy can create for allies. Um, for dedicated multinational armament projects, but also for the integration of European uh, defense industry supply chains, right? When it only comes to smaller parts um, uh, that, that, that go into certain products. And Germany and France might have found the solution with this kind of uh, successor to the schmidt uh, negotiations, but, but still, it, I mean, it, Germany doesn't have similar um, contracts and with, with other allies, and it's, it's still an open debate. And uh, under, at least under the current coalition government in Germany, there are still some debates about introducing um, an arms export law, kind of um, codifying a more restrictive approach to arms exports. And the, the, they, they currently work on that, the government. And so, it looks like, and at least several politicians from, from the government, uh, including Foreign Minister Baerbock, mentioned in their speeches in the Bundestag, even on the 27th of, of February, basically stating that, you know, the export of arms to Ukraine is an exception and we can't take that for granted. So that issue will reemerge um, sooner or later, probably sooner. We, we'll see about that. The second uh, thing I would like to, to highlight essentially are, are structures. And structures kind of, I think, in mostly in this case, Bundeswehr structures and kind of its structural level of ambition, so to speak. Um, so, no, so, so far, no major changes to the overall force structures were announced uh, in, in course of the Zeitenwende. And I mentioned earlier that, you know, in, in, in some selected uh, equipment procurement cases, this might have an impact on existing force structures. So for example, 
buying additional P-8 uh, maritime patrol um, aircraft might, you know, adding five additional maritime patrol aircraft to a base fleet of initially uh, eight will change structures, force structures naturally. But, you know, these are no, no major changes. There are some debates going on um, how procurement will shape, for example, also the focus of the um, land forces. So, you know, will we add more medium brigades or, or not add, I'm sorry, will we replace existing um, equipment with equipment more tuned to medium brigades or to heavy brigades? And there, there is some, some discussion going on and, and, and not, an, not a decision has been reached. So force structures might change a bit due to procurement decisions. But overall, and I think it is crucial to highlight this point really, also coming back to the question Paul um, brought up, like what would Germany do with the money? I think overall, Germany's pledges to NATO over the course of the NATO defense planning process, so the last NDPP cycle, are still the yardstick the Bundeswehr adheres to and you know tries to fulfill. Um, and that is, I think, really, really crucial to state um, that the NDPP pledges by Germany are the yardstick and the special fund at least in my understanding, as far as it is conceived. Um, and, you know, the, the 100 billion euro when taken from thin air, the, the Ministry of Defense kind of calculated, you know, put a, put, put a sum under it and was like, yeah, we need this much money to fulfill our pledges to NATO. And that is like the, the genesis of the 100 and billion. And it remains, it's main goal really to to go for for those um pledges so you know three divisions um with multinational shares um being able to provide electronic warfare capability via the upgraded euro fighters and stuff like that so if you if you i i think in a, in a large part if you want to answer the question what will what does germany want to do with the money it's about uh, its nato pledges period um last point or last area which will be really interesting to observe over the next couple of months um are processes right i mean one of the first things everyone in germany was talking about was like you know regardless more or less regardless over how many years you want to stretch the special fund it's a significant influx of money in a procurement system so you know, special fund of 100 and billion only for procurement. Current um, yearly German procurement budget for the armed forces is around 10. So even if you stretch the fund over 10 years, or you know, I don't know, 15, you double and or nearly double the existing procurement um, amount of money that has somehow. Um, to be channeled through the various um, elements of, you know, procurement processes, um, and that is a lot, a lot to do uh, and a lot to process. And so the, the the question is: Are current capacities of the procurement system able to process that much input and, and influx of money? Um, and kind of in, in process, I mean, it, it, it has a structural, uh, limb, structural dimension to it. Do you have to reform the procurement system fundamentally? But you know, can you can you reform a procurement system which is which basically has to deliver starting in 2023, and that is quite a, a, a huge risk. And so far, that isn't the road the government is taking, but it has rather decided to tweak some processes um, in the procurement. So this includes, um, for example, giving local commanders, for example, a Lieutenant Colonel, you know, more money to spend on his own term to, for example, for maintenance issues and not uh, route every, um, everything through the central 
a procurement uh, agency in, in, in Koblenz. Um, this includes basically saying, yeah, let's, let's use Article 346 more often, right? So go the way other allied countries go more often and exclude European competition from tenders mm -hmm. by, by, by using this uh, European article. And um, there are additional ideas in a, in a law, which is really called law on the acceleration of procurement processes in the Bundeswehr, <clears throat> which will run for five years and you know, include further exemptions and, and ideas on how to accelerate um, procurement. But, but still, uh, these are no, no major um, procedural uh, uh, reforms so much. And so the, the question remains open whether the procurement system will be able to process that much money. And um, maybe three last points kind of going into an outlook. Um, the, the first one is really we have to keep a close eye on how the regular defense budget evolves, right? Even if you rotate and it has happened, some procurement projects from the regular defense budget into the special fund. Um, it is still it, it it can't remain flat. If it if it really remains flat as it is projected right now, um, and if you know cost development trends um, develop like they did over the past five years, six years, when it comes to you know. The personnel becomes more expensive, maintenance becomes more expensive and whatnot. The regular defense budget can only do uh, maintenance and personnel in 2026-ish. And all of your procurements would have to come from the special fund, which isn't, a, which isn't intended at all. But it, 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 it gives an odd, odd look that the government, you know, retains a, a flat regular defense budget and kind of puts the special fund in front and says, no, no, we, we, we got this covered. But this question on the relation of, you know, procurement and maintenance and personnel um, remains open so far. The second point is really what happens when industrial and, and parliamentarian interests um, develop an impact on the planned projects? I mean, these projects, for the most part, are, are no surprises. Um, they, they kind of were known to, to informed observers, yet in most cases, simply there was no money to really pursue them. You know, case in point is the heavy transport helicopter. Um, and right now, everyone is kind of happy, you know, having having delivered the solution to, to long-standing problems. But the devil lies in the detail when it comes to industrial participation, especially of the German defense industrial base in, in some of the projects which are um, designated as, as imports, right? When it comes to the maritime control aircraft, F-35, heavy transport helicopter and, and, and so on. And especially in the the heavy transport helicopter, the um, procurement failed a couple of years ago due to excessive involvement of the German industry and then a, a price spike, which scared of parliament. Um, so it will be interesting to see whether industrial and, and parliamentary interests can kind of recover from the shock of the past three months and be able to organize their interests to, um, and thus, you know, simply complicate uh, the, the procurement process. And I think the, the last point really is then kind of related to that, this question of European industrial interests and Europeanization where this imports. And I think I'm pretty sure that that will be a topic we might uh, talk about today, or at least the German and, and, and French government will talk about in the future. Um, so um, that is, I think this, a trade-off between, you know, speed of procurement and political and industrial uh, and European interests really is something that is also recovering from from this, in the the shock of the Russian invasion and the kind of multitude of of reactions across Europe. Um, 
and let's see you know also how the uh, alignment and negotiations and actions by the european commission come into play and and you know how to coordinate vastly more money in the system coming from the individual individual member states and financial incentives by the commission on the vat exemption and you know to be honest losing potentially losing or decreasing credibility of germany and, and france to to, our, to the east and our eastern allies and um these kind of the, the interactions of all these factors uh, are really interesting, will be really interesting to watch. And with that, I'll stop and look forward to your, to your questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Torben, for this very uh, substantial uh, uh, input. Uh, I'm grateful also to uh, the participants uh, for their questions because I'm following uh, their questions in the Q&R. And I will try to uh, uh, already integrate some of, of their questions into the, the discussion. So I take from the different points from uh, uh, Paul and from Torben, I would, I would at this stage take three main uh, topics. I would take the topic of sustainability of the commitment and we will come back to it. The, the question of structures, because you very rightly pointed out, Torben, the, the question of the structure of the, what do we want to, what do, does the Bundeswehr want to achieve uh, in this regard? And uh, I will take the point of cooperation armaments project, because it is from, seen from Paris, it is also a, a major issue. And would see also, I would also say seen from Brussels and seen from Europe, because it has also a potential impact. So I would start with the question of um, sustainability, because uh, I think one of the big, big questions is also, uh, the, it is at the same time a, a technical question and, a, and a, in the first place, potentially a, a political question, because uh, there could be a kind of a, of a conflict of objective uh, within the coalition as regards uh, the, the uh, first the necessity to, to spend more for uh, for defense but also uh, the question of the of the so-called uh, debt break uh, because um, this is one of the of the main points of the on the political agenda of the liberals and mr Lindner uh, would also put in, uh, into question his credibility on this issue uh, so um, the, the, the question I would like to the first question I would like to ask to, to Paul would be, um, do you think that uh, this debate about the 100 billion uh, special fund has changed the political consensus within the coalition or did it simply, uh, was it just a, a suspension for the necessity of the, of the, of the cause to, to, to give this signal and that we could imagine that in a, in a few months time, this question could, could or should come up, especially if we consider the, 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 the potential uh, uh, degradation of the, of the macroeconomic situation in, in Germany. And I would also uh, include in this question another one taken by one of our participants, uh, which would prolonge my question indeed. Um, what about changing the rules of the Maastricht criteria, like changing the German constitution by adding a new paragraph in order to adapt the Schuldenbremse? Similarly, uh, the military expenses could be included in the debt GDP ratio, which has been proposed for long by France and refused so far. So it, this is a prolongation because what is happening in Berlin on this issue has a major uh, impact uh, for Europe. And I think uh, we have also to consider uh, the debate uh, with, this, uh, with this consideration. So Paul, what, what, what could you say uh, on this? Um, a lot of things, <laughs> in it because there is a, a big um, political discussion uh, on these topics in three months in Germany. And maybe we, we have to, to see the, the debates uh, inside the coalition, but also between the coalition and the opposition of the CDU, CSU. And um, 
First, I will say there was a positive reception of uh, Scholz's announcement uh, on February uh, 27. And that's, that's, that it, that's, it, it, there is a, a, a consensus uh, among the German political uh, classes and, and population uh, since this announcement. But we have to see also there is a strong emotion it was a strong emotional uh, moment and uh, Torben mentioned already this uh, uh, question with uh, weapon exports uh, what is uh, very new in the, the German uh, politics and um, we have to, to see first maybe the, the tension uh, between the different members of the, of the, of the coalition um, the special funds, we have to, to, to think that there is maybe a lot of people from France uh, in our participant. We have to, to, to explain that. Uh, this special fund is in part of a challenge to the pacifist uh, principle uh, <coughs> um, uh, from the Greens, but also from the left wing of the, uh, the Social Democrats, uh, uh, Social Democratic Party, SPD. And the acceptance of, of the fund was particularly painful for the Greens. Uh, in February, uh, because economic, uh, economics minister uh, Robert Abeck and foreign minister Annalena Baerbock were not informed in advance by uh, Olaf Scholz uh, and finance uh, minister uh, Christian Lindner about the exact uh, amount of uh, refinancing. Um, the coalition contract from uh, November to, uh, 2021 uh, stated that Germany will invest, I quote, in the long term 3% of its gross domestic product in international action, including diplomacy and development, without specifying the share uh, reserved for defense. Uh, we we uh, think here to the 2%. And, the main strict, uh, striking point, points was the question of how the special funds uh, should be used. Uh, for the Greens, uh, the, the ones that the money uh, to be used for alliance and defense capability, and not just for the Bundeswehr. And it's, uh, it was the, 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 the biggest points uh, between the Greens and the CDU uh, during the negotiation. And the Foreign Office, <coughs> as I said, edited by uh, the Green and Elena Baerbock, uh, wants uh, to, to, want you, uh, to benefit for, from this. And um, they, they wanted to, to invest more in diplomacy and development cooperation, in the feminist foreign policy and so on. And they are knowing that other funds will be, as, 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 as um, uh, Torben mentioned, uh, other funds will, will be less available in the future. And uh, you, you mentioned that Finance Minister Linda wants to return to the, the, the debt break from uh, 2024 uh, uh, onwards. And uh, for the Greens, it was uh, the moment to, to, to use these funds. And uh, second point, the Greens are particularly opposed to the NATO targets of 2%. Uh, Annalena Baerbock, I quote, uh, said, spending 2% of the economic power on the army means that we would spend less in a recession. Uh, we would then reach the percentage, but we will still not have bought a single helicopter. And it's a great debate. Uh, Investments, but 2% uh, of the uh, GDP from Greece is not 2% uh, of the GDP of, of, of Germany or France. Uh, that's why the change in the basic law doesn't contain uh, the, the target of the, of the 2%, but just <coughs> the special fund of uh, 100 billion. Um, they said, and the argument was, in some years, we will spend more, more than 2%, in other perhaps a little less. And this position of the Greens, it's uh, the second party of the coalition, uh, were also shared by a, a part of the SPD, including uh, the group leader uh, uh, in the Bundestag, uh, Rolf Mützenich, 
and the co-leader co of the party, Saskia Esken, uh, uh, who is uh, in the, the left wing of the, of the SPD. And before the coalition negotiation, we spoke with Eric about this uh, yesterday, uh, there was an interview in the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung from Saskia Esken, and she said, uh, clear uh, we will not reach two percent target in the same way every year and um, for Saskia Esken uh, the, the fluctuation in arms uh, procurement are as are the, 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 the reason and um, it's, it's, a, it's a really a, a big a big problem in the coalition because there is also in the SPD as a uh, so-called white wing, uh, which are for the two percent uh, since years, and uh, we have also to say that uh, the problem of uh, refinance, uh, refinancing of the Bundeswehr, are uh, also the problem of the finance minister Olaf Scholz uh, during the, the, the last um, uh, few uh, years. The third party in the coalition, the Liberals, uh, FDP are uh, um, opposed to, to uh, uh, um, opposed of a weakening of the 100 billion uh, euro package for, for the Bundeswehr. They said uh, civil defense is certainly a central task for the states, uh, but they will uh, give the money only for the Bundeswehr. And it's also the position of the union uh, of the, uh, the, the CDU and CSU. Uh, and at the end, uh, there, will, uh, there, there was uh, um, the, the, the debate, the vote uh, will be postponed uh, in the last uh, uh, week because there was no um, consensus between the member of the coalition and between the coalition and uh, the CDU CSU. And the CDU CSU um, said we, we, it's not our fault, uh, it's, it's inside the coalition. There is a lot of problem inside the coalition and we, we are ready and we, are, we, we will uh, vote for this uh, uh, change, but uh, the coalition have to be clear its mind before. Um, what is the solution uh, in the uh, uh, change of the constitution? Uh, the solution is uh, now as follows. Uh, it was agreed that measure for cyber security, uh, civil protection and stabilization of partner countries, that uh, the, the Greens position would be also taken, but that uh, they will, uh, <coughs> actually, uh, sorry, they uh, would be financed from the federal budget, not from the special funds. And uh, this will uh, therefore be financed uh, finance from the defense budget or other items uh, that uh, victory uh, uh, for the CDU CSU and uh, kind of a defeat uh, for the Greens. About the question of uh, <coughs> Maastricht and so on, um, there is also in Germany a debate. Uh, what's, uh, uh, what is the problem? And I saw. Uh, for example, the position of uh, Baden-Württemberg uh, finance minister, the Greens Daniel Bayas, and uh, he, he believes that uh, the, the 100 billion special fund uh, is not a good idea. Uh, he said he, he called it a crazy hidden budget because this money will also have to be uh, paid back at uh, some point. Uh, so it's, it tends to be ignored. And according to, to Daniel Bayas, uh, special funds are legally fragile. Uh, for example, in uh, S, uh, in Essen, uh, the Constitution could under such a construction. And the, 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 the last point uh, for him, uh, uh, he said there will be many different special, special funds. Uh, and he, he said, uh, he spoke uh, out in favor of a reform of the debt break. Uh, for example, an additional annual mini debt uh, for future investment will be more sustainable from the point of view uh, uh, of financial uh, policy. Uh, but we know that the, 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 the Chancellor Olaf Scholz and, um, <coughs> and um, the, 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 finance, uh, uh, the finance minister, Christian Lindner, are for the, the reintroduction of the, the debt break. Uh, so uh, it's, it's also a tension uh, inside the coalition. Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, 
to prolong this discussion, I would like to ask a, a question uh, to uh, Tarbon. Uh, from your point of view, uh, is there a, a, a risk uh, that this uh, vote by the Bundestag of the Special Fund could be uh, contested uh, before the uh, Federal uh, Constitutional Court in Karlsruhe? Uh, this is a point. And from your point of view, uh, because I think that the question raised by one of the participants is, is, uh, is, very, is right as regards uh, the future developments uh, in the European debate. Um, I think that, do you think that this, this, uh, this, uh, this question could uh, uh, bounce back uh, at you, 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 uh, you, in Europe uh, as regards the adaptation of the uh, rules of the Stability and Growth Pact uh, by exempting, for example, uh, uh, defense spending, uh, defense investment, uh, uh, from the from the from these uh, rules. Yeah. So, um, I'm not a lawyer. So you know <laughs> what I can say about the constitutional court and the special fund is to be taken with a grain of salt. But you know, as, as Paul hinted, the, the other so in particular a special fund, federal special fund for the kind of green transition and, and, and for, for, for climate friendly transition of Germany is actually contested before the constitutional court. And it might happen that the same um, will happen to the special fund of the armed forces for the Bundeswehr. But I mean, it, but there is actually only basically one player who could, you know, more or less try to bring it be before the court in the politi political spectrum, which would be the, the leftist, the, the, the left party, as even in the, you know, right wing, the uh, AfD party, I think roughly half of parliamentarians voted for the special fund and half uh, against it. But I think, if I remember correctly. So it, it might happen that it will be challenged before the Constitutional Court, but I haven't heard anyone talking about planning to do that. And normally, or, or, I mean, in many cases, one or more political actors will immediately after such a decision, you know, state the intention to, to go to court to, to challenge it. And that, as far as I know, hasn't happened. So might happen, but I would, I would probably say it's unlikely. Um, and regarding Maastricht and, and the Stability Pact, I haven't heard anyone talking about that, to be honest, in, in Germany. Um, I think everyone is quite... A, kind of happy with the solution found now to to be able to, to invest to invest the the special fund in terms of kind of the size of the um, special fund as you know a share of the uh, total federal debt at least is not that drastic so in terms of the purely federal held debt it's like 100 billion of, I think, 1.5 trillion by now. So it's you know, not great, not terrible, so to speak. Um, and the debt break, as, as Paul mentioned, has, has fans in, in high ranking positions. But I haven't really heard anyone talking about you know, Maastricht and the exemptions, exemptions and trying to um, use such pathways to be able to, for example, uh, increase the regular defense um, budget more. And given how stark really the resistance over the past years was um, in the German political systems, a system to, to, towards such reforms, would also probably think that it won't happen um, anytime soon. So on, on both accounts, 
not very helpful uh, answers, but I would I would argue possible, but not very probable. Thank you, Tarban. Yes, it, I think th these questions will pop up uh, in the coming months because we are at a stage in the, uh, I would say, in the implementation phase, and it's a bit early to 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 to, to discuss. But I think we have to keep this in mind. I would like now to 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 address the issue of uh, structures because I have a, a lot of uh, interesting questions, and I would. Uh, First, start with a, uh, with a remark because, Tobin, you were very uh, clear as regards uh, the goal uh, of, this, uh, of this equipment process because you, 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 you mentioned the, the pledges made by uh, Germany as regards NATO and uh, you also mentioned the, the, the objective uh, taken uh, to, to uh, provide uh, three multinational mechanized division by 2032, which is the uh, the, uh, the, 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 the end of the, of the trajectory. But in the meantime, we have for 2027 uh, the, 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 the commitment to provide a, 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 a division, uh, a, full, a, a, a fully equipped division with a, with a, with a, uh, head, with a headquarters. And the, also, I think, I, as far as I remember, three uh, combat brigades. Uh, so uh, do you think that this, uh, that this uh, uh, effort, this financial effort is in line with this objective? And I would take from uh, uh, pa uh, participants' uh, uh, questions to, to complete what, uh, my point. Uh, one by Paul Taylor. Uh, I, I, I read the question. Listening to Torben, uh, it sounds like Germany is mostly going to spend the extra money to fight yesterday's war without taking into account the lessons of the Ukraine conflict on the need for lighter, more nimble networked forces rather than heavy platforms. Is there any debate about this in Germany? Or is the procurement plan essentially on autopilot steered by outdated, I quote, outdated NATO force goals? This is a very, uh, uh, <laughs> a very uh, pointy question. Uh, and uh, another one by Jacques uh, Marie Lossian. It seems that the impact of the special fund is mainly dedicated to equipment investments. We know that today the Bundeswehr has lots of planes that do not fly, lots of ships, including submarines that do not navigate, and lots of, tank, of tanks that do not move. The key reasons are clearly identified. Lack of efficient maintenance, lack of edu educated and trained uh, troops. Do you believe this fund will rally will really contribute to transform the Bundeswehr in an efficient army if these key points are not addressed in a yearly budget. So these are the questions uh, as regards uh, the structures. So Torben, you have a lot of, uh, of things on your plate. What, yeah. could you, what could you say about this? Okay, so I'll, I'll start with the uh, division on, in, in, in 2027, right? That was the, the original plan. Um, and at least the um, German chief of staff, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know what the French equivalent is right now, um, stated that at the end of March, roughly, um, that they actually want to present this fully equipped division with three combat brigades now in 2025, right? So accelerated the goal. Um, you know, including uh, divisional forces, including um, support forces, uh, also from from um, other uh, service branches. So, really, um, really trying to accelerate the timeline here. I. <laughs> I don't know whether that is realistic, to be honest. Um, but I have to admit that kind of it, it's very difficult to, to really um, assess that from, from the outside right now, um, given a limited availability of, of information on, on 
stuff like like, like readiness. Um, so there's at least the plan to to accelerate the first division to to twenty twenty five. Given that there are still even at least now problems um, with the provision of one um, fully equipped brigade might be unlikely. It might be nice to you know put it as a goalpost and say we have to move faster and to also you know by the armed forces build um, additional political pressure on on the political system. But we, we really have to see whether that is that is realistic, right? I mean, 2025 is soon, ve very soon in terms of procurement, training, certification, organization uh, timeline. So I think, I mean, 2027 is, is pro probably realistic from a spending slash equipment point of view. 2025, we'll have to see. But that kind of brings me naturally to the Second question on, on uh, or third question on, on, on readiness. I mean, the, the one part of the equation certainly will benefit from the additional money and from the transfer of certain procurement projects out of the regular budget into the special fund. And that will likely lead, lead at least in the next two years or so to better availability of spare parts. Um, and there were at least announcement, announcement, uh, announcements by the armed forces that kind of, how to say it, um, procurement using every trick in the book to reach a certain number of units is out of the question. Now, to make that concrete, you know, in the past, sometimes uh, Bundeswehr planners would buy I don't know, three submarines to buy three submarines, but the money wouldn't suffice for spare parts for 20, 30 years of its <coughs> operational lifetime. So they would buy three boats, but not the spare parts. And at least some high ranking offices now stated, no, no, we're going back to kind of, you know, logical pre end of Cold War uh, mode of buying sufficient spare parts with the equipment. And it, it, I mean, if you now buy spare parts for, for your equipment, it might take industry a while to produce it and, and so on and so forth. But I think on that part, the, the additional money will certainly help. Really the problem, um, I, I wouldn't argue the, the problem of, you know, trained troops for maintenance is really a problem. There, there is extensive cooperation with the industry. And even though the defense industry in Germany also has kind of a headache to find um, you know, people, um, it still works quite well so far. What might be a problem really is a lack of you know, trained uh, troops um, in some specialized um, roles. And it remains to be seen whether that will change. I mean, there are apparently an increased interest uh, and increased um, in, 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 in serving uh, in, in, in the Bundeswehr. But of course, you know, even if you hire people now, it takes years and years to, to really educate the specialists. So glass half full when it comes to, to really readiness. Um, it, it won't be, I, I think it will be better and it might reach kind of the, the average other allies have. And I mean, every basically every ally I think struggles to a certain degree with readiness uh, but it will not be perfect obviously <laughs> and the question on, on, on lessons learned and fighting fighting the past and the outdating of, of NATO goals I mean that is at least in my impression a discussion which NATO allies within NATO had for over the past year even be, before Ukraine right some allies chasing innovation and chasing um, the new stuff. I mean, the, the, the UK, for example, is uh, in, in, in its proposed reforms, very much leaning towards trying to, to uh, utilize emerging technologies and you know, putting an emphasis on, on um, 
on cyber and space and information warfare and whatnot, while others are really focusing on on the traditional stuff, the the heavy metal. And I personally, I'm so I sorry. I think really the the, the Bundeswehr is pursuing those NATO goals, but the debate whether they are outdated really only starts maybe not even starts now right i mean it's personally i would argue it's too early to draw any lessons from the ukraine uh, ukraine conflict um simply i mean armed forces and intelligence agencies may start to do that but for an outside observer i think our picture to a certain degree is skewed and it's difficult really to, to get into a, a solid assessment of, of what has worked and what, what hasn't worked. And this debate about nimble forces where there's heavy forces um, w- will not go away. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, at least for some parts of the German land forces, this debate also happens right now. But in general, um, we, we still tend to to favor really yeah, heavy formations and the traditional picture of conflict. And in, in that way, I think to, to a certain degree share the view on the issue that our central European allies have. And um, yeah, so Germany p- pursues those goals. It will be really interesting to see whether the next a NATO defense planning process cycle will come to, to different results. Also, you know, taking in what, what NATO might learn from, from the Ukraine conflict and from conflicts uh, happening that had, have happened since the last cycle. Um, but so far, Germany certainly falls onto the heavier side. But as I said, I, I personally, I wouldn't wouldn't necessarily argue that the you know light and nimble forces is the solution. Um, even though, last last point on that, there is a quite famous concept paper written by the German army on you know the the, the future of land combat in in ten years. It is now, I mean, it's four years old I think by now. But it also included a vision of you know more unmanned system, more transparent battlefield. Um, less man platforms, swarms, you know, kind of in line what most of us, um, or most observers imagine as the future of warfare. But um, I mean, it it hasn't um, translated yet really into into uh, a massive change in force profile. Last point. Um, it was quite a surprise that the special fund includes, I think, half a billion euros, 500 million euros for AI-related research and capabilities. Um, it's still a bit unclear what those research and development projects um, will be. I mean, it's, I think, I'll, I'll, I'll have to look. It's uh, navigation and surveillance and security of large spaces. So. ISR navigation, so nothing uh, too revolutionary, but it was uh, an interesting surprise. Okay, thank you very much, Torben. So we see that uh, it is uh, in the making, and uh, the, 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 this discussion we, we will have to follow the, the development of this discussion. And, and now I would like to address a third uh, basket, I would say, from a discussion, which is related to cooperation, because you. Uh, it has been mentioned by you, Torben, and by, also by Paul, that uh, uh, this uh, investment process uh, will also open the, the door for p- p- potential uh, and already existing uh, cooperation projects, because uh, one of the uh, issues at stake is also to preserve an industrial base uh, in Europe. And uh, in this regard, we have especially uh, seen from Paris a special interest for uh, preserving uh, already existing uh, cooperation programs. And here I'm thinking of uh, especially the future combat aircraft system. And there is also another project uh, regarding the the future uh, uh, 
main uh, uh, main battle tank, uh, which is also uh, uh, part of a, of a bilateral uh, project. And here I would like to uh, <coughs> mention some of the questions uh, which have been raised by the participants, uh, which are in line to with what I've just said. What about the collaboration of the European industry? Um, such as uh, SCAF in the light of the acquisition of the American F-35. Um, we have also uh, other questions. Uh, what place for cooperation with EU partners? Uh, what place for the off-the-shelf purchase of platforms? Uh, and one question also is Airbus business model should be extended to many European military equipment. So these are, the, I would say, the reactions from the participants. First, I would give the floor to, to uh, Paul to see uh, what can we say about the uh, future combat air aircraft system. Is the program, uh, could we consider that the program has been uh, preserved in the course of this process, or is it still uh, a question mark? And when, when can we say more generally about the, the place? Uh, to be given to uh, cooperation at uh, European level. Thank you, Eric. Uh, first, uh, a little remark about the, the, the question of capabilities and uh, the question of um, the, 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 the material in, in the German army. Uh, I, I give two, two examples. Uh, the, the Puma, there is uh, theoretically, uh, on, on paper, there are 350 Pumas, uh, armored infantry fighting vehicles, of which 150 are actually operational. And for the Tiger combat helicopter, out of 51 aircraft, only nine can take off. So the 100 billion euro made a difference to the deployable state of the Bundeswehr. We have to say that. But it will not solve all the problems. Uh, two examples for the deployable state of the Bundeswehr, 20 billion euro are still missing for ammunition alone. And 20 billion euro, that's the, the sum of the investment requirement for dilapidated barracks, for example. But about FCAS, for example. Yes, uh, we heard in France uh, that uh, with this fund, Germany will be more American. Germany will not participate to the European co cooperation of defense, uh, what uh, President Macron will. Uh, the debate in Germany is really, we have to understand that in France, the debate, the debate in Germany about the F-35 uh, fighter jet is about nuclear deterrence. We don't have nuclear deterrence in France because we have our own uh, nuclear weapons. And in Germany, it's a debate since uh, a few years about this F-18, that was uh, the solution proposed by Angela Kramp-Karrenbauer, and the solution is not possible, and the, the, there was too, many, too much debates and uh, uh, not a solution, and now we need a solution in Germany the tornadoes cannot fly anymore. Mm. And the solution is to buy 35 F-35. That means it's not the half of the tornadoes. There is, I think, 83, 84 tornadoes now in the, the, the um, uh, uh, German Air Force. The special fund allows that Germany buys F-35 allows to that Germany can continue the project, the FCAS project. There is no choice between... It is not, not an alternative. It's not an alternative. The, the two projects are possible with this fund. Um, there is a lot of problem with the, 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 the FCAS between Dassault in France and Airbus and the model of, uh, of Airbus and so on. Uh, maybe it's uh, more uh, French debates uh, than uh, Franco-German debates. What uh, uh, today or yesterday, uh, Eric Trappier, the, the CEO of, uh, of 
Tasso said uh, it will be uh, delayed to uh, 2015 or 2014. Yeah, there was a lot of problem with the FCAT. And the problem is what is the purpose for Germany? Uh, uh, electronic war uh, and Germany has uh, by now the uh, 15 uh, Euro fighters for electronic war. So Euro fighter is uh, maybe uh, a little old fashioned now. And uh, what will be the future? It's, it's a big question. I have no answer. I, I speak with a lot of people and uh, there is a lot of interpretation. In the next few years, what will Germany do? More F? Uh, 35 because they will have uh, the technicians, the pilots, and so on, or a political de decision because it is a political decision to make uh, 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 fighting uh, jets with France and Spain. And now the German government, the, the, the defense ministers, the, the, the German chancellor say we will make this this jets. Uh, uh, Scholz says that in February, uh, Christine Lambert says that in, 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 in March. It's open. I have no answer. I will stay optimistic. I, will, I want to be optimistic mm -hmm. because, uh, because it's a symbol. Maybe it's a, just a symbol, but uh, we have to, to make it quickly because we need uh, new jets uh, in, in Germany, in France, and we, we need this, this, this uh, Franco-German cooperation. Uh, it's a symbol of for Europe. And uh, I will uh, end my, 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 my uh, speech with this question. We have also to understand that uh, Germany is not the only country in Europe uh, which by F-35. There is also Finland, there is also Belgium, uh, Belgium, uh, maybe uh, Switzerland. And uh, the question is, what is the purpose of the German army? What is the purpose uh, it's, uh, in the NATO, in the European Union? Uh, can we have a common uh, defense cooperation in uh, Europe? And uh, what is the future of NATO in Europe? Uh, what is the future after the war in Ukraine? Uh, what uh, will the NATO do? Uh, uh, we know that uh, since Obama, uh, this, 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 I will not say that NATO is brain dead. I will not say that, but there is a lot of debates uh, between Europe, between the, uh, the member states of the European Union and uh, the USA of the future of NATO and the future of the common defense policy in Europe. Yes, thank you, Paul. Yes, it's part. This debate is also part of a, of a broader debate on the on the trans, transatlantic dimension of uh, of security and the capacity for Europe to close uh, the capability gap, which has been uh, strengthened over the last twenty years, and uh, also which is questioning the the I would say the the respective role of the U.S. and and the Allies, and it's it's a key issue in the, in this context. But uh, and you have we are right to, to uh, insist on the on the different dimensions of the of the debate. The, the, uh, there is a, an internal uh, French debate on these programs because there are different uh, interests at, at stake, and there is a probably potentially a, a, a German dimension of, of the program. But what is at stake is also the future of a, of a, of an industrial base in Europe. And as you mentioned uh, briefly, uh, Torben, as regards uh, the UK projects uh, for defense, what is at stake is also the capability to, for Europe to uh, uh, invest on uh, emerging and disruptive technologies as regards their, uh, uh, their uh, different uh, fields of application in, in defense. Um, what do you think of this debate on, uh, on cooperation program? And uh, you mentioned also in your uh, earlier statement uh, the important role played by the rules on exports because it could be also a, 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 a factor of a complication, especially between France and Germany. Uh, what, what is your view at this stage regarding the, the state of the cooperation on the, on the armaments project? So I think I'm... Um, I'm, I'm rather optimistic when it comes to the 
kind of political or the importance accredited to European uh, cooperation programs by the current government, right? So they are all huge fans of, of Europe and the chancellor made that clear in his speech mentioning, you know, first and foremost cooperation, European cooperation projects from EFCAS, MGCS, Euromail. So the high political and symbolic value of, of these cooperation projects, um, at least in, in my opinion, makes it likely that this government will pursue them further. Um, I mean, period, in, in, in a certain sense. So that is um, especially important for the German Franco projects. And I think um, Germany is trying to, to really make clear that, as Paul mentioned, the F-35 will have a limited role uh, and that buying these planes by no means diminishes uh, the German commitment to the future combat air system, you know, regardless of all the, the, the problems um, the, the industry in two countries had when it comes to that. So, I mean, that is, I think, really, really important. Um, Chancellor Scholz also mentioned other, you know, European cooperation projects, for example. Uh, the uh, common submarines with Norway. So it, it really was an integral part uh, of a speech and of the government communication as a whole to really focus on, on the European dimension there. I mean, when it comes to um, this question of partners and industrial and of the shelf procurement, um, so I just looked um, at the, the list of projects and to be Frank, where Germany pursues imports uh, and off-the-shelf equipment really is in areas where the development of European capabilities either was cancelled long ago, so industrial capabilities couldn't provide this equipment right now. Um, for example, for the heavy transport helicopter, right, we cancelled the European development when back in 20 in 2004 i think so you know that there is no much debate about uh, to, to to buy off the shelf or, or buy from from europe i think there are selected examples that will become a problem simply because um there there were especially franco-german plans right the maritime patrol aircraft is one area um the German reluctance to commit to the upgrades and further development of Tiger tech helicopters is another issue, which you know isn't found in the special fund, wasn't really commented on. Germany, as far as I know, didn't commit to the upgrade program France and Spain committed to. So selected, a few selected programs will suffer uh, and the question then becomes like how do you weigh the high political commitment to to some of the important uh, projects where there's really um, a, 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 a focus largely immediate on generating capabilities uh, in and I mean that might sound controversial but minor capability areas um, so yeah that is I, I think mostly import is, is related to, do we have the industri industrial capability? No. And then this argument of, you know, we have to generate capabilities now comes in and, and overrules that. But as I said earlier, it, it will be interesting to see what happens when parliamentary, when, when parliament and, and industrial considerations enter the picture. Um, what I've, maybe I, one thing I would like to highlight uh, on the special fund and the project. So uh, given that the command capabilities and digitalization have received quite a you know, substantial funding with about 20 billion, I have to look it up. Um, might be, so it's, it's an interesting hint that Germany might get serious about interoperability with its European partners, which was limited uh, in the past several times so even you know german units being the least modernized when it comes to communication equipment so i think that's an 
an important important point to highlight um, when it comes to kind of how procurement will translate into tangible and military um, increased increased military capabilities and, and cooperation with our uh, allies, you know, especially in the uh, multilateral formats like the enhanced forward presence. Um, maybe one last sentence on the Airbus model and, and other sectors. I mean, we're, we're trying it, I think, in, in the land sector um, with um, Next and and, and, Kambi and and But there's kind of a similar problem as with the FCAS, but just a mirror image, right? Where you have Rheinmetall as, as kind of the uh, other actor in, in, in Germany when it comes to land systems. So the complete integration of, and this, of German Franco industrial capabilities in one sector or another seems simply unlikely. And until that is the case, um, these conflicts, as in FCAS between Airbus and, and Dassault, and um, as in MGCS, I mean, Technically, it's resolved between um, Next and, and KMV and Rheinmetall, given the, the work shares. But I mean, Rheinmetall is pursuing their own business strategy on the side. You know, given the announced un, un, uh, announced um, not main battle tank, but let's say fire support vehicle in in, in Paris next week and, and and stuff like that. So um, the Airbus model isn't. Perfect. It's an interesting start, but it, I, I don't see further cons large scale consolidation happening anytime soon, especially you know, if now more money flows into it. It will be even harder to convince industry and to convince politicians and, and um, decision makers to pursue consolidation. Um, I think, yeah, that's it from my side. Okay, thank you very much. We are now. Uh, uh, I think uh, we have uh, reached the end of our uh, of our uh, of our discussion. So I thank you very much, uh, you both, uh, you Torben and you Paul, for the, your uh, input. I think that this uh, discussion uh, remains it is a starting point uh, for an ongoing debate. Uh, we will see in the coming uh, days and weeks uh, how it will develop because we have uh, the uh, adoption of the. Uh, of the strategic concept, the NATO strategic concept, and we see how also this debate is reflected is reflected within the alliance. We will see also how is it is reflected in the uh, on the uh, in Brussels in the European debate, and we will see also how it is reflected in the uh, in the bilateral format in the Franco-German dialogue, especially with regards uh, to the upcoming uh, Franco-German ministerial council. I think these are different landmarks which will uh, contribute to provide us with more um, clarity on the evolution of the of the of the debate. Uh, one thing is sure: uh, this uh, war in uh, Ukraine has uh, deeply changed uh, the parameters of security in Europe, and uh, the question remains: uh, what will be the main, the the the, the best answer to 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 this uh, to this uh, challenge? And uh, nobody has any, uh, nobody has a solution, and it's part of a, also of a dialogue, uh, interactive dialogue between allies and partners uh, on these different fields. But uh, the movement taken or the decision taken by the German uh, uh, government has deeply changed uh, the, uh, the the parameters of the discussion, and I think uh, it is welcomed to see that Germany is taking a, a more responsibility uh, in this debate and is also uh, more uh, proactive. So I thank you very much, uh, Torben and Paul, for this discussion. I thank you and th also I would like to thank the participants with their uh, uh, questions because it was, uh, I, I had uh, a lot of, of questions. We tried to answer most of them and I, I thank you very much for, their, uh, for your participation. I would be very pleased if we could uh, resume this discussion at a later stage to see where we stand and how this discussion has developed. And it is also 
also always a, a pleasure to have you, Torben, uh, through the, on these different issues, and uh, I, and we really appreciate your uh, your your contribution. So and thank you, Eric and Martin, for your moderation. Exactly, exactly. Thank Thanks for having me. Bye. Good day, everyone. Yes. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.